Okay, we're live. Yay, we did it. Awesome. <laughs> all right, so first of all, thank you so much, um, Dr. Bradley Miller. I know that you're very taking time to talk about um, and Andrea, would you like to start with introductions? Um, Just sure. Introduce yourself. You can introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Andrea Miller, and I'm the president of CDG Care, and we are promoting our Give Lively campaign through the month of November, and we are very excited because Dr. Bradley Miller with University of Minnesota, pediatric endocrinology specialist and a member of our medical advisory board with CDG Care has volunteered his time to come and join us and answer any questions for anybody that logs in or answer and also answer the questions of those um, families who have submitted um, some of their specific endocrinology questions ahead of time. So welcome, Dr. Miller. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, and I'm Karen. I um, also wear a lot of hats, I feel like, but I am a CDG mom and also the president of the board of directors for CDG Care. Um, so first of all, I think that this is an important topic to start with um, because there were a lot of questions that were brought up through social media. Um, what do you, how does the growth chart compare from a typical kid compared to a CDG kid? So I think it's a really important oh. question. Um, in previous um, analyses in smaller groups of kids, we've found that children with different forms of CDG have varying degrees of growth impact. And it tends to be in the first couple months of life that we start to see children fall off the curve, either for weight or length or both. And um, uh, then after a while, kids tend to level out and maybe catch up a little bit um, and then uh, uh, follow their own curve, I think is what, what we hear a lot of. And I, I think it's important to recognize that um, being sick a lot or having trouble uh, either eating or absorbing your nutrition can impact all of those things. And so um, your first three years of life, you do a lot of growing. And so it's a really important window for growth. So uh, the effort to try and capture what does growth look like in CDG um, that has been supported through the CDG care group, as well as the um, FCDGC, um, the consortium, scientific consortium to study uh, congenital disorders of glycosylation is to try and gather as much information as we have about children with different forms of CDG and see, can we describe a consistent growth pattern to say this is a normal or a typical pattern for your child with CDG. And so um, it can help you say, this is where they should be on the curve based upon their condition. And uh, um, I think it's a really important effort so that families can understand are there kids following the track that we would expect them to do? Yeah, and I also, I'm glad that you brought up the, if the child gets sick, because I feel like, especially in Dominic's, he's five now, but especially in his earlier years, and I mean, he still struggles. He, we'd put a little bit, you know, you kind of celebrate every ounce, and then he'd get sick, and we go right back, to, you know, and then you get that up, and then you go right back. And I think um, doctors that don't know a lot about CDG, um, really put an emphasis on, emphasis on it. And it's, it's like, but you don't understand. It's really hard to do this. And the more that you, food you push in, the likely that they throw up is, you know, more significant. And yeah. um, so I know that we, Andrea, I know that we're doing, um, are we still getting the data for that growth chart project from everybody? If people go on to cdgcare.org, they're able yeah. to all that data in? Yeah, we had a really big push for data to be gathered through the end of July, but we still are accepting the data and we are forwarding it to the um, researchers on Dr. Miller's team, as well as the CDC, so that we can have those growth charts developed. Hopefully we'll have some dashboard data available in the coming months and um, it'll be really enlightening to kind of help the clinical community see that um, 
that, you know, what the challenges are and what the re realistic goals are for kiddos with CDGs. One of the big things that I think affects the, the weight is the muscle mass. And uh, uh, with hypotonia that's present in, in so many of the CDGs, part of that is the amount of muscle tissue and the amount of bone that's actually present. And so, um, as you said, every ounce is precious, but um, our expectations may need to be lower just because the amount of muscle and bone that we expect to be happening is lower than we would see in typical children. And so uh, though we may need to stress on nutrition, we may not need to stress as much as we tend to do. And as far as the amount of data that you've received, um, have, were you, have you been able to go through some of that and try to, to collect it and get like a good idea, some common um, weights of kids and were you able to do anything with the data yet? Not so far. So we have a, a big group of the data um, that we had just been starting to look at and share with our expert epidemiologist at the CDC to start to get that initial look. And uh, uh, we're not there yet, but uh, we're close. Uh, we very recently shared data from all the centers and then they had to say, well, wait a minute. It didn't say if they were boys or girls and we kind of need that for the chart. So so they're little, little pieces are uh, being done to fine tune the data and make sure the numbers make sense before they generate that first look. Got it. Um, so I, expect, I expect we'll have that, as uh, Andrea was saying, in the near future, at least a first glimpse. Yeah. All right. Well, then it's important to tell people that if they have not done this, then they should. I know when I did it, it was very quick. Um, I think a lot of the bigger hospitals have portals now. So it was pretty quick to download yeah. that data and just, mm -hmm. you know, copy paste. Um, so it didn't take nearly as much time as I thought it would have. Um, but yeah. ev everyone that, that hasn't done it, please, we encourage you to go on to cdgcare.org. I think it's right on the first page, you'll see the growth chart project. Um, and again, you would be, you know, helping the rest of the community to get this going and, and finalized. Um, Thank you. All right, so I let's look and see in the right. I'll say that if anyone that is watching, I know there's only a few on right now, if you do have a question for Dr. Miller, please um, just, Post it in the comments and, and um, I will do my best to ask. Um, but we did get a few questions from our polls on social media. And one of the questions is, um, since CDG is a metabol metabolic disorder, do you think it's a good idea to have an endocrinologist on the CDG patient's medical team, regardless if they haven't had any need yet? So if they haven't presented any symptoms that would kind of prompt them to go see an endocrinologist, do you think it's important in general to have uh, an endocrinologist on their medical team? So I have a biased view being an endocrinologist. Yeah, that's true. Also, <laughs> also somebody who uh, um, knows about CDG since I've been taking care of kids with CDG for more than 20 years, um, but I'm unique in that respect. Um, so I think that when concerns come up about growth, uh, low blood sugar, which was one of the questions on on the uh, on the list, um, puberty and bone. Those are all areas where we as uh, pediatricians and pediatric endocrinologists are the experts. And so, if a child is having fractures that don't don't make sense, fragility fractures, that's a reason they need to see us. A lot of questions come around puberty, which is, you know, a ways in the future for a number of kids. Yeah. And I think it's a really important discussion because um, boys with CDG tend to go through puberty, but may not make as much testosterone as they should. And that has its own negative impact on both growth and muscle mass and, and, the, and the bones. Um, for girls, there's a lot of questions about estrogen treatment. Um, and it's safety because of the coagulation problems that children with CDG can have and the risk of stroke-like episodes or deep vein thromboses. And so those are definitely reasons when an endocrinologist should be involved. And um, 
I was on a call earlier today with uh, um, Eric Eklund from Sweden, who's an expert in CDG, and one of our um, uh, hematologists to try and develop some guidelines for what should people do when they're considering estrogen therapy for girls with CDG because of that blood clot risk. And so I think having that expertise as a group and sharing our knowledge is really important because we're tracking some unknowns here. You know, we're, we're going down pathways where we don't have a lot of data to right. say the right thing. Um, and then I think if there are thyroid abnormalities, that's the other common thing that we see where a thyroid blood test is abnormal. Um, if it's only abnormal once, then probably doesn't need to see an endocrinologist. But if there's more than one time where the thyroid levels are off, I think that's a reason to, to see an endocrinologist. So my bias would be that everyone has to see one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I think more specifically, since the more specialists, the more visits, and we, we don't want to increase that if, if there isn't a, a specific benefit or a role, but when specific questions come up in those areas, I think it's really important um, for an endocrinologist to be involved. Answered a lot because that you actually answered a lot of the the rest of those questions in that one. So that was pretty good. So let's just do one more, um, um, and that is at what age in in CDG is hypoglycemia supposed to balance out, if at all? So it's it's a great question, and um, you know, metabolism specialists and endocrinologists are both experts in hypoglycemia for different causes. And um, uh, some children with CDG have a problem where their body makes too much insulin. Um, it may be just in response to feeding. It may be random. Um, those issues for most kids balance out around, you know, six or 12 months of age, but um, can last into the two to three years of age um, category. Some folks will have it lifelong where it's like, I need to eat frequent small meals or I feel icky. And if I get sick and can't eat, then I'm going to, you know, get sicker more easily. Um, but I would say for most kids, you should see the majority of low blood sugar problems better within the first year and definitely by four or five years of age. Um, Part of it is having enough fat mass um, to have a little bit of reserve so that when you get sick, you can burn some fat um, if you're able uh, to uh, have extra fuel. And that's that's one of the things that kids kids will do to to balance their blood sugar um, out. Um, for kids that are requiring tube feedings as a as a sole source of nutrition, it can be a little bit longer because some of the ups and downs are related to the continuous tube feeds. Yeah, I think that's what I, I deal with with Dominic. It's like no, trying it's it's a hundred percent that uh, it's that my body is used to being fed all the time. Yeah, and then when I don't get it, I'm like, wait a minute, where's my food? Yeah, exactly, and then of course, you know, when you get sick, then it's like you know, the sugars just kind of go rogue all over. Yeah. The so, so there are some children, and I've taken care of uh, young one young woman who's now 30, I think. Um, she still has blood sugar issues. So, so they don't necessarily always go away. That's why I said it can yeah. be a lifelong yeah. uh, um, problem. And, and as you said, during illness is when kids really, um, they can have high blood sugars or low blood sugars because the stress of being sick sometimes makes your stress hormones make your blood sugar go up. And then once you burn through those yeah. stores of sugar, then you're you're going low because you just don't have any fuel backup. Right. So um I actually learned a lot from this little chat. So, so that was really awesome. good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Absolutely. Um, for taking the time to do this. I am I mean, I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else did. And this will also be recorded. It'll be on our um, CDG Care Facebook page if ever, anyone wants to go back and listen. Um, we do have a so, question, Karen. 
Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Awesome. There's a question um, oh. from Mary Wong. She wants to know, Dr. Miller, are you taking new patients um, out of state virtually? Are you doing any virtual visits? And um, so she's calling in from California and wondering if she would be able to get a consult with you. And yeah, that's from I'm, Mary Wong. Thank you, Mary. It's an excellent question. And um, we're struggling at our center, as many centers are, with uh, what to do with virtual patients for rare conditions, uh, virtual visits for rare conditions. And uh, currently, our lawyers and many other lawyers are saying if you're not licensed in the state where the patient resides, that you can't do a virtual visit uh, because you're practicing outside of your, your medical license. And so Right now, I am licensed in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and we're trying to expand that to about eight states around Minnesota because of exactly this issue with people who more typically come to see us. But uh, our Rare Disease Center is trying to work to expand that, uh, but right now we're not able to. And I know I have, I live in Colorado, Mary, and um, so my endocrinologist actually reached out to Dr. Miller. I was able to get his email contact information, and we can provide that um, to you as well. And then if you have a local endocrinologist who's willing, um, Dr. Miller is always um, really a great knowledgeable source for other clinicians. Yeah, I do that all the time. And, and that's one of the things as being part of the medical advisory board, we we provide Guidance, but not medical advice, I guess, is the best way to say that from a legal perspective. Great. All right. All right. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Miller, thank you so much. If you would like to sign off, you are free to do whatever you want for the rest of the evening. Thank you so much. I'm glad thank we you, set Dr. this Miller. up. Thank you. Have, Have a good day. evening. Have a good evening. And then Andrea, really quick, I just want to tell the audience just a little bit about Giving Tuesday tomorrow. Um, you've seen a lot of promotions on our Facebook and Instagram. We've been doing this for, gosh, how many years now, Andrea? This is our fourth year. Fourth year. All right. Four years of Giving Tuesday. It's the global day of giving. Um, it's basically a day to give back to uh, a mission, a charity, something that you really strongly believe in. Um, and we would love for you to support CDG Care. All of the funds donated for CDG Care will go towards the 2023 research projects. We just posted a Facebook post yesterday about all, was it yesterday? Yes, yep. about all of the amazing research projects that some of our Giving Tuesday funds have gone to. So really, really great, exciting things, but we- And everybody's donation will be matched. Yeah. yeah, and everybody's donation will be matched. So if you donate $5, you're actually donating 10 and so forth. So we really hope to um, get rally some support over the next 24 hours. Yes, wonderful. Um, I think that's it. I think that was, that. that's that's about it. We, we nailed it. We did it. <laughs> Thank right. you everybody for joining. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, bye. bye. bye.